Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we'll provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. India thrashes Pakistan for raking up Kashmir issue at UNGA. India's resolute stand against Khalistan propaganda persists. And counter-terrorism operation continues in Jammu and Kashmir. In a recent global forum, Pakistan sees the opportunity to level what many see as baseless and damaging accusations against India. Adhering to a historical trend of hostility and steadfast preoccupation with its neighbour. On the 24th of September, during the United Nations General Assembly session, Pakistan's interim Prime Minister Anwar ul Haq Kakar unsurprisingly raised the contentious Kashmir matter. Nonetheless, India's response at the UNGA was unwavering as they dispatched the young diplomats to deliver a firm and unambiguous condemnation of Pakistan during the right of reply segment. Once again, Pakistan utilized the international stage to promote unfounded and malicious allegations against India, a pattern consistent with its past behavior and persistent focus on India. On September 24th, during the United Nations General Assembly, Pakistan's interim Prime Minister Anwarul Haqqakar predictably brought up the Kashmir issue. However, this time, India responded resolutely at the UNGA, failing the young woman diplomat Petal Gehloth to condemn Pakistan in unequivocal terms during the right to reply. I take the floor to exercise my delegation's right of reply to the statement delivered earlier in the general debate by the representative of Pakistan. Pakistan has become a habitual offender when it comes to misusing this August forum to peddle baseless and malicious propaganda against India. Member states of the United Nations and other multilateral organizations are well aware that Pakistan does so to deflect the international community's attention away from its own abysmal record on human rights. We reiterate that the Union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh are an integral part of India. Matters pertaining to the UTs of JNK and Ladakh are purely internal to India. Pakistan has no locus standi to comment on our domestic matters. New Delhi also highlighted the human rights violations in Pakistan, saying that the country had a long history of persecuting its minorities, including Hindus, Sikhs and Christians. Recent years have seen a distressing increase in targeted oppression and violence against religious minorities within the nation. One of the most severe human rights crises in Pakistan is the enduring violence in Balochistan province. The Baloch people have been striving for independence from Pakistan for decades, with Pakistani security forces facing accusations of committing serious human rights abuses in the region. Suspects are often detained without charge or convicted without a fair trial, leading to thousands of people being held in illegal military detention without due legal process. Furthermore, enforced disappearances in Balochistan have been a long stain on Pakistan's human rights record. The use of enforced disappearance by Pakistani security agents continues to play a significant part in their attempt to quell Baloch self-determination and constitutes a major human rights violation against the people of Balochistan. According to recent figures released by COIOED in July 2022, a total of 8,696 cases of missing persons have been reported. While 6,513 of these cases have been solved, 2,219 are still pending. Not only people in Balochistan are suffering violence against women and girls, including rape, murder, acid attacks, domestic violence and forced marriage is endemic throughout Pakistan. 
Human rights defenders estimate that roughly 1,000 women are killed in so-called honor killings every year. As a country with one of the world's worst human rights records, particularly when it comes to minority and women's rights, Pakistan would do well to put its own house in order before venturing to point a finger at the world's largest democracy. A glaring example of the systemic violence against minorities in Pakistan was the large-scale brutality perpetrated against the minority Christian community in Jaranwala in Pakistan's Faisalabad district in August 2023, where a total of 19 churches were gutted and 89 Christian houses were burnt down. Similar treatment has been meted out to the Ahmadiyyas, whose places of worship have been demolished. The condition of women belonging to minority communities in Pakistan, notably Hindus, Sikhs, and Christians, remains deplorable. According to a recent report published by Pakistan's own Human Rights Commission, an estimated 1,000 women from minority communities are subjected to abduction and forced conversion and marriage in Pakistan every year. Pakistan's continued efforts to raise the Kashmir issue at the UN are seen by many as an attempt to divert attention from its own domestic problems. Pakistan is facing a severe economic crisis and is also struggling to deal with the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. It is high time that Pakistan stops using the UN platform to spread falsehoods about Kashmir. Pakistan should instead focus on addressing its own domestic problems and on promoting peace and stability in the region. Women in Afghanistan have been facing numerous challenges since the Taliban returned to power in 2021. Girls and women in the war-torn country have no access to education, employment and public spaces. The Taliban rulers are dictating what women must wear, how they should travel, workplace segregation and even what kind of cell phones women should have. Recently at the UN Security Council quarterly meeting, members discussed the situation in Afghanistan in which the rights of women and girls took center stage and called for a resolution labeling the treatment of Afghan women by the Taliban as gender apartheid. Ever since taking control of Afghanistan in August 2021, the Taliban continues to muzzle women's rights in the nation. Over the span of just two years, the group has systematically marginalized women from public life. Recently, at the UN Security Council quarterly meeting, members discussed the situation in Afghanistan in which the rights of women and girls took center stage. The Taliban's attack on women's rights... Seema Sami Bahaus, executive director of UN Women, stated that the last time the Security Council met on Afghanistan, it was reported that there were more than 50 edicts and decrees restricting women's rights. More have been added since. The last time the security met on Afghanistan, it was reported that there were more than 50 edicts and decrees restricting women's rights. More have been added since. The number of families living in poverty has nearly doubled in two years. More than two-thirds of people in Afghanistan require humanitarian assistance to survive. 20 million face acute hunger the majority of whom are women and girls, and the cost of the food basket has gone up. Household debt has increased sixfold. The Taliban's attack on women's rights exacerbates this, pushing women out of job and opportunities to generate income and out of the education they need to be part of Afghanistan's future. The Taliban are not simply failing. International human rights lawyer Karima Benown, a civil security representative at the meeting, called for a resolution labeling the treatment of Afghan women by the Taliban as a gender apartheid. She stated that the oppression of women is central to their system of governance and a core part of their philosophy. Many governments, UN officials and experts, including the Secretary General himself, have labeled the situation gender apartheid. Along with many Afghan women advocates, I believe the gender apartheid approach offers one of the most promising ways forward. The Taliban are not simply failing to uphold women's rights. Oppression of women is central to their system of governance. 
Earlier this month, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turf, accused Afghanistan's Taliban of a shocking level of oppression of women and girls and said human rights in the country were in a state of shock. Turk's speech coincided with the publication of a UN report covering the period March 2022 to August 2023, which noted a systematic regression of the rule of law and human rights in Afghanistan, particularly with regard to the rights of women and girls. The shocking level of oppression of Afghan women and girls is immeasurably cruel. Afghanistan has set a devastating precedent as the only country in the world where women and girls are denied access to secondary and higher education. Restrictions are becoming increasingly severe, quelling women and girls' fundamental freedoms, effectively confining them to the four walls of their homes, to invisibility. Afghanistan faces grave difficulties, with de facto rulers ignoring world leaders' demands and instead blaming the West for the country's challenges. The Taliban rulers refuse to acknowledge that a more moderate ideology could have led to a better situation in Afghanistan. A century ago, the women in Afghanistan were free. They enjoyed the right to education, right to political participation and the right to movement. Even in the 1970s, in Kabul universities, women made up more than 60% of students and they were equally represented in several public institutions. But today, under the Taliban rule, Afghan women have been deprived of fundamental rights, let alone having a life of dignity. The relentless propagation of Khalistan's divisive agenda aimed at tarnishing India's international standing can no longer be overlooked, all under the dubious guise of freedom of expression. Consequently, in its unyielding crackdown on Khalistan sympathizers, India's National Investigative Agency recently executed a series of operations in Punjab. They seized assets linked to the Khalistani separatist, the real conspirator behind Khalistani propaganda in US, Canada and other Western countries. Gurpan Pant Singh Panno. After dealing with people trying to create a separate Khalistan state in Punjab, India is now taking steps to stop Khalistan's misleading messages from harming its reputation globally. The National Investigative Agency recently seized assets owned by the Khalistani separatist Gurpatwan Singh Pannu. Designated a terrorist by India in July 2020, Pannu possessed 46 acres of agricultural land in his ancestral village of Khankot, on the outskirts of Amritsar in Punjab, along with a residence in the Union Territory of Punjab. As the chief of the pro-Khalistan terrorist organization, Six for Justice, Pannu is currently embroiled in 22 criminal cases in Punjab, with the majority related to sedition. Having a passport of Canada, Pannu frequently appears in videos, brazenly issuing threats against India unless it accedes to the demands of Khalistan's proponents. Recently, another video emerged on Canadian social media featuring Pannu openly warning Canadian Hindus to leave Canada and return to India. The video also called on Canadian Sikhs to gather in Canada's Surrey for a referendum, blaming the Indian High Commissioner Sanjay Kumar Verma for the death of another Khalistan leader, Hardeep Singh Nijjar, who was fatally shot in June of this year. And if you are wondering how such elements can thrive in a so-called low-abiding country, then you must know Khalistan's propaganda now enjoys shelter and protection from political leaders of the highest echelons. Recently, the Canadian Prime Minister leveled accusations against the Indian government, alleging that Nijjar's death was a premeditated assassination orchestrated from New Delhi. Delhi denied allegations, but that doesn't appear to suit Canada's ruling dispensation's short and long-term political ambitions. Uh, what we told the Canadians, 
Uh, one, we told the Canadians that uh, this is not the government of India's policy. Two, we told the Canadians saying that, look, if you have something specific, if you have something relevant, you know, let us know. We are open to looking at it. In the last uh, uh, few years, uh, Canada actually has seen a lot of organized crime, uh, you know, relating to, you know, the secessionist uh, uh, forces, organized crime, violence, extremism. They're all very, very deeply mixed up. So, in fact, we have been, you know, talking about specifics and information. We have actually been badgering the Canadians. Uh, we have given them a lot of uh, information about uh, organized crime leadership, which operates out of Canada. Uh, uh, there are uh, a large number of extradition requests. Uh, there are terrorist leaders uh, who have been identified. Uh, so uh, do understand that there is an environment out there. Our concern is that, uh, you know, it's, it's really been very permissive uh, because of uh, political reasons. Uh, so we have a situation where actually our uh, diplomats are threatened, uh, our consulates have been attacked, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and often comments are made about, uh, you know, there's interference in our uh, politics. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of this is often justified uh, as saying, well, that's how democracies work. On Canadian soil, several protests, countless threats against India diplomats and consulates, referendums against India, and even desecration of the Indian tricolor have taken place, transforming Canada into a sanctuary for anti-India Khalistani elements. In the wake of these baseless accusations, the Canadian government also expelled a senior Indian diplomat, Pawan Kumar Rai, from Canada. This move raises concerns about the future of diplomatic relations between the two nations. However, the international community has not shied away from rebuking Ottawa's actions, characterizing the dissemination of unfounded claims as a questionable act. Some of the terrorists have found uh, safe haven in Canada. Canadian Prime Minister has this uh, 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 way of just uh, coming out with some outrageous allegations without any supporting proof. The same thing they did for Sri Lanka, uh, a terrible uh, total lie about saying that Sri Lanka had a, uh, a genocide. Everybody knows there was no genocide in, this, in, in, uh, in our country. And I saw yesterday he had gone and given a rousing welcome to a, somebody who have uh, associated with the Nazis in the past on the Second World War. So uh, this is questionable and we have, uh, we have dealt it in the past. Uh, we have uh, categorically rejected those outrageous allegations. So uh, I'm not surprised that sometime uh, Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau comes out with uh, outrageous, unsubstantiated uh, allegations. Despite the existence of an extradition treaty since 1987, another treaty on mutual assistance in criminal matters since 1995, and an agreement on social security since 2015, Canada's recent actions in support of Khalistani elements under the guise of freedom of speech and expression have strained relations and threatened these long-standing agreements. Political analysts contend that these actions are driven by Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's desperation to secure a third consecutive term as he grapples with diminishing support and formidable opposition within his own country. Trudeau has aligned himself with a new Democratic Party led by Jagmeet Singh, compelling him to endorse pro-Khalistani propaganda for political gain and the prospect of a third term. However, the repercussions of escalating tensions between the two nations will not be confined to the political arena alone, but will also impact trade between their economies, potentially affecting international relations and the Indian diaspora residing in Canada. Now let's talk about Jammu and Kashmir where the joint efforts of the Indian Armed Forces and the Jammu and Kashmir Police 
continue to thwart the plans of terrorists trying to disturb the peace and tranquility in the valley. Recently, the army and the Jammu and Kashmir police conducted a series of operations resulting in the arrests of several terrorist associates involved in the supply of arms and ammunition to the active terrorists. A report. The Jammu and Kashmir police and the Indian army over the last two weeks conducted a series of joint operations in the Baramulla region, resulting in the arrest of a terrorist and eight associates of lashkar e taiba along with a stash of illegal arms and ammunition. The operation led to the recovery of a cache of arms and ammunition including five pistols, seven pistol magazines, 53 pistol rounds and 10 hand grenades. Involved in the smuggling of illegal arms and ammunition into Jammu and Kashmir, these associates were receiving arms and ammo packages from Pakistan and then supplying them to the active terror groups in Jammu and Kashmir. The terror associates arrested in these raids included a juvenile and two women associated with Pakistan terror organization lashkar e taiba तेईस सितंबर 2023 को जो है इन्हीं जो पहले ही गिरफ्तार हुए दो दहशतगर्द थे यासिन शाह और परवेज इनके पूछताछ में जो और डिटेल्स हमें मिली उसकी बुनियाद पे बारामूला पुलिस और इंडियन आर्मी की जॉइंट फोर्सेस ने मुख्तलिफ इलाकों में सर्चेस कंडक्ट की और जाबाजपुरा बारामूला में हमें यासिन शाह के घर से जो है एक पिस्टल एक पिस्टल मैगजीन और आठ लाइव राउंड्स भी बरामद हुए उसके डिस्क्लोजर पे साथ ही साथ इसमें दो फीमेल टेरर एसोसिएट्स भी मुलवस हैं जो इन टेरर एसोसिएट्स के साथ मिलके इसी गैरकानूनी जो भी असला और हथियार है इनकी तस्करी और एक्टिव टेररिस्ट तक ये हथियार पहुंचाने की जो साजिश थी उसमें मुलवस थी अब जाके जो है इस टोटल जितनी भी ये कार्रवाई हुई है उसमें अब तक हमने छः लोगों को गिरफ्तार किया है जिसमें एक एक्टिव टेररिस्ट है यासिन अहमद शाह और बाकी जो पांच उसके साथी हैं इनमें से एक जो है जुवेनाइल है और इनके पास से अब तक हमें टोटल पांच हैंड ग्रेनेड्स तीन पिस्टल तीन पिस्टल मैगजीन्स और चौबीस पिस्टल राउंडस की रिकवरी हुई है ये टोट ये सारा जो मॉड्यूल है ये भी जो है पाकिस्तान बेस्ड हैंडलर्स के आ, कहने पे बारामुला और नजदीकी इलाकों में दहशत गर्दाना कार्रवाई को अंजाम देने की फिराक में था प्रीवियसली द सिक्योरिटी फोर्सेस इन अ रेड अरेस्टेड फोर पीपल सस्पेक्टेड टू बी एसोसिएटेड विद एलईटी फ्रॉम द बडगाम एरिया इन कश्मीर सो फार 14 टेरर एसोसिएट्स एंड एन एक्टिव टेररिस्ट फ्रॉम एरिया सराउंडिंग बारामुला बडगाम एंड कुलगाम have been apprehended in the month of September. Terror associates are the people who are responsible for providing all logistical support needed by terror groups. This sometimes include providing terrorists with shelter in the region. Experts believe that inclusion of Kashmiri women and children as terror associates is done presuming that women and children will not be prone to thorough searches and can cover a wide area without raising any suspicion. Pakistan ISI is targeting the youth through the medium of social media and the internet and of course also the Molvis in the masjids, some of them are there who are targeting the youths and trying to radicalize them. We have seen Pakistan has fought so many wars and every time they tried it, they, they have had a very bad experience. General Ziaullah started this operation Topak where it said because he, he realized that it is difficult for Pakistan to beat India and take Kashmir by force. So he devised this uh, operation Topak in which it was proposed that it was a mission of thousand cuts. They would train the jihadis who were already that time in fighting sometime in, um, in Afghanistan and uh, there against Russia. They would be used to be sent across the border and the local population would also be encouraged to help these people and rise, have an uprising and Kashmir would come into Pakistan's lap. That never happened and therefore 
today we see that people in Pakistan have risen up against the regime of their own because they say that what you have done is in the 75 years for Kashmir to become Pakistan, you have ruined our lives. Be it deadly terror attacks, illegal drugs or manpower supply or radicalization of Kashmiri youth, Pakistan has not deferred itself from indulging into anti-Indian activities. Islamabad's decade-long obsession with Kashmir has led to deprivation of food and development in its own country. But despite its internal instability, failing economy and international isolation, the country does not compromise when it comes to funding terrorism. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa.nin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.